All right. Elizabeth, can you hear me? I can. I got you loud awesome. and clear. I like that. We didn't even talk about the blue theme ahead of time. <laughs> we were just both totally synced up. We are in our groove. Oh, we could feel <laughs> it. Awesome. Well, we already have 40 plus people in here before our start time even hit and more people rolling in real quick. Everybody. This is super exciting. This is the 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 coolest response we've had to one of our webinars so far and this okay. digital content you know obviously this has been a crazy year for everybody has been ramping up for us in the last few months since we've been able to kind of find our groove in um, providing some education to this community yeah and uh so you know this is a really exciting way for us to close out the year and turn the corner and uh, we'll give people a few more minutes to roll in. But how are you doing today? I'm great. I'm great. And I want to take that opportunity to thank you. You do play such a critical role in the ecosystem and I'm so happy for you. And I'm so um, proud of you for being so nimble. You know, we all had to pivot and shift and pivot. And, and of course, we're still pivoting. Uh, but you were really quick to do that. And you continue to offer this great service for everybody. So I'm glad so many people are finding value in it. And even for those, you know, who aren't attending, who might see it later recorded. Um, I really appreciate that you're giving a spotlight to this. Absolutely appreciate that. And sa same to you. And I was thinking, you know, it's really interesting. We met it was just a little over a year ago, right at, at Nil Zacharias's yes. event, an event, yes. a live human event in LA. Oh yeah. And it's, it was, you know, just only a couple months before everything got crazy. Um, yeah. You know, but we were, we were both traveling and, and watching this space grow before our eyes then. And so, you know, it is, that was kind of where this idea birthed itself to, to hold in a, a session like this at, what was supposed to be our live event in New York City back in June. Obviously that didn't happen, um, but that theme kind of carried forward and we reconnected you know, only a few weeks ago and felt that it was appropriate yeah. to kind of revisit this topic of, of giving kind of an overview from, from your perspective of working with so many people in this space, um, you know, where we're headed. So you know, we're really excited to dive into all that. Yes, thank you for that. Um, it's with my consulting agency, Plant Powered Consulting, and also with all the people that I've interviewed on the Plant Based Business Hour. Um, you know, I feel like I am told to update my computer, but I won't do it. You can still see me, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Someone telling you to update your computer? Well, okay. um, Adobe is, but I'll I'll oh, deal, I'll talk to I, them later. You're coming in loud here right now. <laughs> oh, good, okay. good. Um, you know, I, I don't probably don't need to tell all the attendees this. The world is changing like underneath our fingertips. It will be so different by the end of this hour than when we started. I mean, the change is happening so quickly, and the dominoes are falling. We'll talk about this a lot. Dominoes are falling so quickly, and are we ready? Some parts of the supply chain are ready, some parts aren't, and the winners are really going to be those who adapt the fastest, just like our friend Darwin says. So um, it'll be a really interesting conversation today. Absolutely. And I think that's a good segue. If you're ready, I'll uh, kind of kick things off here. We've got a, a whole bunch of people. I'm seeing the names roll in. It's you know really hey, great for everyone who's taking an hour out of their time, uh, you know, pre-holidays, pre-New Year's to tune in with us and just kind of get caught up on, on where things are heading in this exciting food world that you uh, we find ourselves in the middle of when we're working on plant-based related topics. Um, and so uh, Elizabeth here, Elizabeth Alfano is uh, a plant-based uh, consultant, also hosts the Plant-Based Business Hour, has a lot of experience just connecting with people and businesses across this space. And the reason why we feel you know this is a great topic for her to discuss today is because of that well-rounded view of the space to be able to kind of pick up on trends and just little bits of insight that could really provide some value. Um, and, you know, we have a very diverse group of people attending right now and across our network from buyers in the food industry, uh, brands, investors, all the way to healthcare professionals, nutritionists and doctors, um, even, you know, consumers and influencers that are excited uh, about advancing people towards this lifestyle. Um, but what really was exciting about this topic to me is that, you know, the question we get so often from our buyer audience, you know, this key mm. group of folks that the brands that exhibit with us as a trade show, you know, the, the companies that are really changing the game right now, uh, the, the buyers that are buying their products, when we connect with them and we have key, key uh, councils of buyers that help us develop our event, 
they're constantly the one, the number one thing is always, what are the trends? How do I, how do I get one leg in front of all of these other competitors, whether you're a restaurant, whether you're a retail store, whether you're a natural distributor or more of a, you know, a, one of these bigger distributors that carries all sorts of products and sell it to big box stores. The question is, is always, how do we kind of just understand if we're not in this space, if we're not eating it every day, if it's not our full passion, but it's such an important part of our business, how do we get a leg up? How do we understand what's coming around the corner? And so, you know, to be able to provide a resource for, for those key folks in our audience that, you know, we're so grateful to have with us um, who are such an important part of this ecosystem is really exciting. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Elizabeth to do a bit of a presentation for the next 30 or so minutes. Uh, feel free to use the chat and the Q&A feature. I'll be monitoring that throughout those, this first half. Um, writing down the questions. Uh, I can interject if there's something extremely relevant. Uh, I'll, I'll ask the question. If not, we'll let Elizabeth talk for a little while and then we'll open it up and we'll have a really fruitful discussion here in the second half. So Elizabeth, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. This is so exciting. You have said it. People are looking for the trends so that they can get a leg up and how to get out in front of it. We've all been running behind COVID, of course. So how are we going to get out in front of this? Let's talk about it. I'm going to share my screen. I'm not the best techie in the world, but this should work, folks. You should be able to see my screen. Out. And of course, now I'm going to start my slideshow. So uh, here we go, folks. Uh, thanks for being with me today. I'm Elizabeth Alfano. I am the founder of Plant Powered Consulting, and I I'm the host of the Plant-Based Business Hour. Okay, let's get into it. So much to talk about. Plant-based food industry, I probably don't need to tell all of you Food touches everything that we do. So of course it changes our entire life when our food supply system change and please changes, please. And make no mistake, our food supply system is changing. Right now it is changing as we speak. Uh, our whole lives change and we've seen that with COVID. So we are, I don't need to tell you, we are living in exciting times. Uh, so let's get into it. Health remains a driving factor. Of course, you guys probably see this in your daily lives. Um, people are more and more more interested in boosting their immune system and reversing lifestyle disease, things like heart disease, diabetes, obesity, all these things make you more susceptible to something like coronavirus and other, other things, sort of teeny FYI out there. There's no rule that says we can only have one pandemic at a time. There's still SARS and African swine fever. These things are raging in factory farms. So, you know, even if we get a vaccine, it's factory farms are still breeding grounds for disease. So, you know, people want to stay on top of their health. And something that we'll talk about a lot is how people are taking control of their health. That's different than we saw before when they might have farmed out their health decisions to, oh, let's say the US government. I'm not so sure people are willing to do that anymore because of COVID, but we'll, we'll talk about that, that, that dialogue that we're having with the consumer. But anyway, so health is a driving factor and you're seeing more and more people say, hey, I'm going to work in those vegetables. I'm going to work out the meat. Flexitarians, this growing marketplace, that's really the flexitarians that are the big driver for business. Uh, vegetarians and vegans have stayed about the same, but the flexitarians market is growing 20%, 23% up from nothing, basically. So together, those vegans, vegetarians, flexitarians are making up a third of the marketplace. That's huge. And that's just going to continue to grow. Just a fun stat. Uh, when COVID first launched, plant-based sales, so this is March of this year, were up 255% compared to meat sales, which were up 53% as people were hoarding uh, compared to 2019. So um, Yes, it's uh, people have, are starting to get the memo. Uh, but even though we have health as a driving factor, another fun stat uh, in COVID, Archer's Daniel Midland did a survey and uh, found that 18% of meat eaters had tried plant-based alternatives and 92% of those we're going to stay with them, have them again, et cetera. So, you know, just growth, growth, growth. Ah, but nothing gets around taste. So yes, people are driven by health, but you can't eat sustainability. You can't even eat really good health. It has to taste good. You, you, there's no way around taste. And that remains um, a driving factor. Thank you, Plant-Based Foods Association for that one. Ah, millennials, how we love you. Probably no surprise here to the world. It's millennials and Gen Z that are really driving this. Again, this comes from the Plant-Based Foods Association. 79% of millennials say that they eat plant-based meats and um, they want to eat more. 60% of Gen Z says 
more, please. So, you know, that trend is just going to continue. Of course, it's not only millennials and Gen Z. We talked about health. So it's the older folks too, that um, sort of COVID driven, if you will, that fire under everyone to get their immune system in order and keep those lifestyle diseases at bay. So the older folks as well, but I'm just talking about the future as we go into the future 2021 and beyond. Uh, these folks are really going to be driving everything. And, and what is what drives them? They're a little bit too young really to, to care solely about their health, uh, the environment. They are deeply worried about the planet that they're inheriting, who can blame them. And they really make the connection of Food Navigator did a study and said that 60, this was back in March, 62% of millennials made the connection that the choices they make in their food affects the environment. This is much more now. I've seen figures thrown around like 90%. So uh, millennials are really making that connection. Perhaps you guys have seen this independent study from the University of Michigan. It's a lifestyle analysis. I'm comparing Beyond Meat to regular beef, but it's give or take for all plant-based options. It's give or take the same. You're talking about 99% less water. 93% less land, 90% fewer greenhouse gases, and 46% less energy. Kind of hard to argue with those numbers. And um, our, our climate crisis is exasperated daily, if you will, but also it's coming to the forefront of everyone's understanding on a daily basis as well. So these numbers just remain extremely relevant. Um, I will shout out, because I'm sharing my screen now, so I don't see anyone's comments or chats or anything. I don't see Ben's face. I don't see anything. So I'm a fast talker. <laughs> if I'm going over too much, too fast, you all just stop me. Someone just come in and say, stop her. She's going oh, too fast. Elizabeth, can you hear can you hear me okay with the yes so, i can yeah you know you're you're action packing in so much here and i think everyone's appreciating all of that so the one question that we are getting is will you be able to share these slides sure um, if the information can be that will give people a second chance to catch up if they do miss anything i think that'd be great Yes, absolutely. And I think Ben is also going to have a recording after yeah, this. So that as well. I hadn't even, didn't even think we will be sharing the recording of this. Uh, we'll be going out in our next newsletter um, a week from now. So uh, make sure you register for that. I did just put the link in the chat. It's theplantbasedworld.com. That's our news site and newsletter. Yes. And I'll say, since we're taking this chance to catch our breath. I'll say, um, you can always hit me up personally. So my website is elizabethalfano.com, but my email is really simple, elizabeth, which is spelled kind of funny, at elizabethalfano.com. So particularly if you're a buyer or a startup and you've got questions, you're sort of navigating this space, just just hit me up. Okay, it's, so- it's unique spelling, I think, is the word. It is a unique spelling, E-L-Y-S. Okay, I'm going back to some stats and figures. So I really like numbers. So again, if I go too fast, Ben will hop in and he'll say, slow down. Uh, so we're talking about the environment and millennials have gotten that memo and there's some great facts to back that up, but they aren't the only ones who've gotten the memo. So the global population is going from 7.6 billion to 9.8 billion by 2050. This comes from the United Nations. Some say this is low, uh, but we're not getting more land and we're not getting more water. So if you're a corporation making food, you're just doing that math on the back of a napkin and you're saying to yourself, well, that's not going to work. How am I going to feed 30% more of the population when animal agriculture takes so much land and more and so much water. And I'm not getting those. I'm getting 30% more people, but I'm not getting 30% more land or 30% more water. So, you know, how unique of a situation. We said these are exciting times. How unique is it that not only there's this consumer pull, give me, give me, but there's this corporate push they also want in on the action because if they're going to make money down the road, they got to switch it up because the inefficient system of animal agriculture doesn't benefit them either for this equation. So here's what you're seeing. You're seeing, and this is kind of an old chart. So it's not even everybody. You're seeing companies like Dan and they've acquired White Wave and Silk and So Delicious. Nestle comes out with their own sweet earth burger. Maple Leaf Foods buys up Field Roast and Light Life. These are kind of older things that happen, but just to add to this chart, you've got JBS, one of the largest beef producers in the world. They now have their own line of Plantera from Ozo Foods. Um, they're doing some really interesting stuff in fermentation. We'll talk about fermentation in a second. Um, you're seeing, um, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the name, but you're seeing other corporations get in with plant-based options, um, innovation centers. Marks and Spencer just put up a plant-based innovation center so that they can uh, be a forefront 
thought leader and innovator in the space. So you're seeing more and more companies, Cargill, you're seeing more and more companies invest in plant-based options because they know that to survive down down the road, they need to be ready for this changing food supply system. Nestle, Nestle is a big one as well. They've been engaging with us over in the UK and have different brands that they're really looking to grow and investing heavily in. Sure. They've got the awesome burger. They've got sweet earth burger. Um, they've been working with Cargill on some things as well. So um, you're just going to see more and more corporations get into this game, but here you see Jensen's and Dean foods and yeah. So lots of activity going on there. Um, and it's not just corporations. It's also uh, fast food. Boy, did they get the memo. So finally McDonald's is on mm -hmm the radar with McPlant. And what I heard sort of scuttlebutt behind the scenes is that the reason McDonald's had hesitated so long is because they thought they were going to sell so many, they were worried about keeping up with supply. Wow. So you've got this wonderful thing going on where you've got consumers wanting it and restaurants and corporations pushing it out as fast as they can. Um, but they're not the only ones who want to see things move or who get that things are moving. Investors, thank you, Beyond Meat, to your IPO in, in 2019. So it's not news from 2020, but that IPO just got so much press attention that it woke up a lot of people who were saying, oh, I can make some money here. So what we saw in 2020 is that there was 1.5 billion investment going into plant-based products, fermented products, proteins. We're going to talk about that again. And uh, cell-based agriculture, what they, they, we call uh, cultivated meat. And fermentation took up a big part of this investment. Anyways, the point here is that this was in the first half of 2020. And that was more than all sales of plant-based meats in 2019. And it was almost as much as all of the investment dollars for 2019. So the point here is investors are investing big. They're starting to see dollar signs. They see that this is a money-making thing because the world is changing. And the more money you have, the more research you put in, the more you can do products. You see how the wheels start turning faster and faster. Money's gonna help do that. So um, here's where it gets really fun. And I've been going so fast because this is in a way where the presentation really starts. And I wanted to make sure I got to this. I'm just looking at the plant-based meat market. 2019 GFI says that sales in 2019 were slightly under a billion. Now, A.T. Kearney and Edison Financial Research is making a prediction that it's going to be about 120 by 2025, that is four years from now, folks. And the same company, A.T. Kearney and uh, Edison Financial is saying that it's gonna be like 340 billion by 2040. Right, huge numbers. Okay, fascinating, so, yes, because uh, we're seeing what plant-based is doing compared to itself. Now here's the chart of all charts. This is plant-based compared to the rest of the market. We're talking about a major mind shift here. Usually people study the meat market and then they study the plant-based market. It's over there somewhere. It's some alternative thing. No, A.T. Kearney studied the meat market, one market. And within that meat market, I'll take your eyes to 2040. 60% of the meat market is plant-based, fermented protein, and cellular agriculture. Meat is the minimal player by 2040. So the green is the conventional meat. It's only 40%. The orange and the gray are all the other alternative proteins. Now, hold on. Why are we alternative if by 2040 we're the thing? Mm -hmm. We're gonna talk about that a lot. The shift in the conversation that we're having with the consumer because we will soon be, this is under two decades, this is my lifetime, this is your lifetime, we will soon be the dominant player. So as we talk about, oh my gosh, the food supply system is changing and how are we gonna get everybody what they need and people are ordering differently, we're gonna talk about all those trends. The main theme here that I want to get across to startups and to buyers is that conversation with the consumer is changing. Who the heck even knows what a fermented protein is? We'll get into that. Cellular agriculture, oh please, these terms have to change. The conversation with the consumer is going to be um, where people can really get ahead, where companies can get ahead, where grocery store buyers can get ahead. We're gonna talk about that. Um, oh, hey, and here we are to start talking about trends. Um, 
I just want to double check that I'm mindful of our time together. Good. Okay. So we're on track. Okay, good. Um, trends, right. So let's get into it. This is why we're here. So let's talk about some of the things that we're going to see and where one has the opportunity to jump out ahead. Um, people are really, we talked about the environment. People are really tired of plastic. So um, the consumer is looking for the whole thing, the whole enchilada. They want uh, eco-friendly packaging as well as whole food plant-based, as well as um, animal welfare, good for the environment, et cetera, no meat, no dairy. So packaging is a major part of that. And brands are going to stand out when they show their understanding that the plastic has to go. Um, you're going to see more and more brands go direct to consumer. They can't be such slaves to um, Will the grocery store pick them up or not? Because coronavirus is going to the left, it's going to the right, it's doing its thing, or maybe there's another, who knows what's going to happen, quite frankly. So they're kind of taking their destiny into their own hands. And I think that's a smart move for the startup. Um, now I'll talk to buyers. What does that mean for you? So uh, my, my last slide of sort of, um, you know, spoiler alert that I'm doing to myself is this is really the time of the empowered consumer. They've been sitting at home with COVID, letting their fingers do the walking on Google, and they're starting to put together that they can no longer disempower themselves by farming out their health decisions to, let's say, a government agency or even a doctor. They have to get control of this right now. So as the consumer does that, they're desperate for information. Yes, people are reading labels more than they ever did, but they still need guidance. So it'll be very interesting in my perspective to see how grocery stores revamp their real estate because it's very hard to find plant-based items. In fact, the Plant-Based Foods Association did a study um, in the Midwest with Kroger. And when plant-based meats were put out in front of everybody, exactly where you would want to find meat, it was put out there. Uh, sales increased 23%. And in the Midwest, sales increased 32%, um, showing that poor underserved Midwest. You know, it's, it's a little annoying. We have these distribution chains where we get things to Brooklyn and Los Angeles. Well, they've got the memo. They don't, they don't need any more help. We need to get it to Tennessee and Oklahoma and Illinois and all these other places. And so when they did that in this study, sales went up to 23 to 32%. So it'll be interesting to see how grocery stores revamp themselves in terms of real estate. It'll be interesting to see if they continue to call the meat aisle the meat aisle, or is it the protein aisle? Because you've got lots of choices now in the meat aisle. It'll also be interesting to see, and I think this is where buyers can really get ahead. Okay, a little bit of levity because it's COVID and we all need it. Sometimes when I go shopping, my feeling is that I'm in an amusement park and I sort of stood in line and I voluntarily got on the ride and now I'm going. So I walk into the grocery store a little bit like, oh God, food shopping, the ride. So it'd be great for the grocery store to help people navigate and make those decisions for themselves that they're wanting. Yes, people are still wanting comfort food. Don't get me wrong. It is COVID and crazy times, but they are looking for healthier options and they're confused. They go into the grocery store and they're like, ah, help. So I think that relationship between the consumer and the grocery store is really going to change, particularly if the grocery store wants to be out ahead with so many consumers going direct to consumer and so many uh, startups going direct to consumer. The same holds true for the startup. That bespoke conversation that you're having with your consumer that really needs to be dialed up to help consumers understand who you are and what you can give them because they're taking in so much information now. So that relationship with the consumer is going to be uh, the end all be all. So let's talk a, a little bit about some more trends, some of them specific to buyers and startups, but some of them just like the market as a whole. So this idea of whole food, plant-based food as medicine, it's the thing, like, yes, yes, COVID has really put an accelerant here. And the exciting things about plant-based proteins is that, you know, you can't really do much more innovation with meat and dairy. It is what it is. 
and the the balance sheets are what they are. You know, that's you're kind of it's a non sequitur, but not with plant based protein. So these things are um, innovating and uh, changing and shifting all the time and getting better, better all the time. So you're going to see cleaner labels, even things like Beyond Meat Impossible. They're going to be moving their products towards cleaner labels. They're not going to be whole food plant based. Obviously, they're still processed, but um, that consumer is going to get a jump up for whole foods plant based and nutrition. You know, food as nutrition, food as medicine is going to become very personalized. So people are going to really, again, dial down for their own information and anything the grocery store can do or the startup can do to help people navigate their own personal nutrition, I think is a big place. Um, okay. So now some general trends. Um, no longer is it enough, I speak to the startups here, no longer is it enough to just be a brand that is cool and that fits in with people. Consumers want to know from head to toe, from CEO down to the customer service rep, what do you stand for? And do you walk the talk? So passionplacement.com is a um, boutique placement firm that is helping um companies that are getting meat and you know animals out of the food supply chain find mission aligned hires so you're fi finding that more and more people are wanting to work for these kind of companies and they're wanting to buy from these kind of companies and i say company not brand the whole thing from top to bottom uh, you're going to see more and more governments and just going down the line here veg tech it's an issue of national security i just wrote an article on this in veg economist singapore of course the first uh, country to regulate and approve cultivated meat, you're going to see more and more countries invest in fermented proteins, cultivated meat, uh, plant-based ingredients. Canada has done this. The EU has done this. Uh, Singapore, again, is very aggressive here. So the United States, I kind of thought we'd see more from you by now. Um, hello. But uh, this is going to be an issue of national security because COVID showed us that food insecurity is a big deal when your food supply chain gets disrupted. Sort of tiny note going back to what we said before, factory farms are breeding grounds for disease. So that means they disrupt job markets and they disrupt food supply chains. So if you want stable job markets and stable food supply chains, you got to you got to get rid of factory farms. Okay, so that has been clear this year, and you're going to see more and more governments get behind that. And then I know we're all about plant-based foods today, but you are going to see people saying, oh, I'm making the change with my foods. Maybe I should make changes in other areas of my life, like uh, the clothes I wear. So that's going to be, um, it's been a lot of time on this slide. Moving on. Uh, that's going to be a big yeah. thing, materials as well. Okay. okay. We talked about the shifting mindset. So here's a big news drop. The largest animal trade show for animal meats, the, sorry, the largest meat trade fair for animal meats, IFA, it happens in Frankfurt. They have just allowed plant-based meats into the trade show. So everyone's getting the memo from the consumer to the producer to um, even the trade shows. Uh, you're just going to see more and more opportunities to buy plant-based options, and they're going to be showing up in more and more places, and the wheel's going to turn faster and faster. We've got more and more investment. It's just um, exponential growth routes at this time. Okay, so let's talk about specifically some of the products that we're going to see. I don't need to tell the buyers here, oh, the frozen food aisle is having a moment. So uh, you're seeing more and more vegan options in the frozen food aisle. Um, brands like Cool Beans comes to mind where they're whole food plant-based. They do a flash frozen product. So you break open the product and you're like, oh, I see the rice, I see the peas, I see the beans. So these kind of flash frozen products where you can lock in all that nutrition, but you don't have to have all the chemicals for shelf stability. So the frozen, frozen aisle just, just is the solution there. Don't have chemicals, therefore it's a cleaner label and it's easy and that's what people want. You know, it's still all about price, taste, convenience. These things can't go away. The consumers want it all. It has to be price, has to be taste, has to be convenience, has to be health, has to be solid packaging with no plastic, has to be a company they respect from top to bottom. They, these consumers are, you know, they're putting their foot down. Sorry to so, interrupt. I just needed to back up your your shout out to Cool Beans Burritos. I lived off them for breakfast for at least a couple months of quarantine once they showed up at my sprouts down the street here. So and, and frozen breakfast burritos in general, Sweet Earth, uh, Alpha, a lot of these companies that have, you know, it's three dollars. You know, I'll eat two of them. So that's six dollars. But that's a really good meal, whether you're looking for something whole food or, you know, kind of more in the alternative um, realm, the frozen breakfast burritos can go a long way. 
a huge way. And they're so easy to eat, you know, millennials love to like eat and walk and then like stand up and, you know, sitting down for dinner is like, you know, later. So, um, you know, it's really convenient and that works for people as well. Um, should I, should I keep going? Go for it. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 I love having you because I'm a little bit talking to myself. I don't know if people are like enjoying this or if it's too much information, but, um, Carry on, I shall. Okay, plant-based seafood, it's the thing. It is the thing. So if we were getting the message about greenhouse gas emissions coming from cows, which to be seems to be the thing that stuck the most, people are really understand how sick the oceans are, how limited the fishing opportunities are because we've killed off the majority of the fish and, and those that are there have mercury, et cetera. And then commercial farming is fish, is factory farming. Factory farming, whether it's crickets, or it's salmon, or it's cows. It's the same thing. So just a teeny little note, um, you know, COVID, we've been so focused on social distancing, and there are 7 billion people on the planet, but there are 77 billion land animals slaughtered every year. So we have 7 billion people, it's 10% of the planet, the other 90%, they live, they breathe, etc., they're not social distancing. In fact, we force them to not social distance as they live snout to snout. You're not going to outrun a pandemic when you've got 90% of the breathing population like living on top of each other because there's no social distancing. So people are getting that message, but not just for land animals, also for seafood. Uh, companies that come to mind here, New Wave is doing great stuff. The seafood, the plant-based seafood company, shout out to them. I love them. They're doing great stuff. Um, uh, wonderful. It's still small. We'll talk about um, some scale up issues later on, but it's still small, but save to sea out of British Columbia does a smoked salmon plant based salmon It's so good. Uh, so you're seeing lots and lots of options here. Sophie's kitchen, of course, has options. And then you're seeing cellular agriculture come here as well for things like shrimp. So very, yeah, very exciting catch as well in that category. Of course. Yes, yes. Yeah, they're, they're frozen, frozen uh, crab cakes and fish burgers are legitimately out of this world. You got to try them. Yes. And uh, shout out to them just for being such a move such a needle mover for people, the planets and animals. I love these companies that are out in front that are really changing the world, you know, so shout out to Chris Kerr and Chad Sarno and um, love them. And of course, good catch. Um, and if anybody wants to, there's a really fun, cool article in Outside Magazine. Outside Magazine she tells you how mainstream this is. This isn't some fringe thing. It's just for people who care about nature, Outside Magazine, but they, they, they talk about meat and dairy all the time, you know. They are talking about how now plant-based seafood is the next best thing. That just came out. It's so very fun to see that as well. Um, so you're going to see a lot of blended products. So corporations that are thinking like, we're not sure how to move our folks from meat to vegetables, but we got to get them there. As we discussed, you know, the world is changing and corporations realize this. So they're going to start seeing, you're going to start seeing lots of advertising campaigns. Like now you can get your kids to eat the vegetables. You couldn't get them to eat before because it's half chicken nugget, half vegetables. It's this blend, certainly not whole food plant-based by any means, but you're going to see lots of blended products. You're also going to see a little bit of cultivated meat in those whole food plant-based products. So maybe a little bit of cultivated animal fat into plant-based products. So those blended products, even from the novel protein side as well. Um, you're finally gonna see things like bacon, it's coming, oh, hooray foods, just get out as fast as you can, please. Um, you're gonna see things like steak, there's plant-based steak coming from, um, they're still a long ways away from big time market, but Atlas Foods and um, Meaty, and there's a new company out of Slovenia, Formidable Meats, they're all doing steaks, braised beef coming out of Australia at a company called Fable. So, you know, they are well at work ribs, you know, all these things are really coming down the pipeline. Okay, fermentation. Um, I am mindful of time just so that I don't go to Oh, you, you cut me off when I have time. I have one one or two more slides after this. Yeah, let's, let's go ahead. You know, we've got some great questions rolling in. So why don't you kind of run through the last couple slides and then we can kind of jump in and start getting yeah. the conversation going as you feel ready. Super fast. I'll just say follow up with me. Fermented protein is coming in 2021. It's going to come even before the steaks. So fermented protein, and I can introduce you to the companies like Nature's Find if you want. They are coming out with, um, and, and here the conversation with the consumer, it's going to be so important so that the consumer accepts this, but these products are coming out uh, middle of the year and you're going to have chicken and um, 
burgers and dairy and it's all coming. Uh, and if anything's having a heyday, it's mushrooms, the, the miracle mushroom and all that can be done with it. You're going to see so many products coming down the pipeline in the shape of burgers and flavors and mushrooms, mycelium, mycoprotein. They are the bomb. Sure. There are some hurdles, but we're getting over those. One of the biggest hurdles is, you know, can people scale up fast enough? Um, you know, we're going to get through the, the legal hurdles. These are already falling to the wayside. The culture is already changing. Government subsidies will fall at some point. It is tricky how China and India are growing still their meat. But again, veg tech is an issue of national security and you're going to see more and more investment coming from them. So um, I think the biggest thing that we have to really, and this is the last slide, is that more than anything I want the takeaway to be here is this is the time of the empowered consumer. So it's that bespoke conversation for the startup or the established company and the buyer. How can you make the consumer's life easier? Because there's so much information out there to guide them through either your grocery store or, or help them find your product because uh, they've got money, they've got time, they've got Google, and they no longer are counting on someone else to figure it out for them. They are taking this into their own hands and uh, they are really engaged. So um, I hope people will hit me up if they're looking to, you know, work out that conversation with the consumer. Now's really the time to get ahead there. Those will be the big winners. Fantastic. Awesome. You got some information up here on the uh, final slide and we can also put this information in the chat. We'll also put this information in the video recording of this entire webinar and Q&A and slides and everything will be released via our newsletter. Uh, it's www.theplantbasedworld.com and that's where you can also find the rest of our exciting content um, but we're going to put that out uh, in the coming week and also in our newsletter blast which will go out on the 17th of December. So Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I don't think you can hear everyone else applaud in this system. So we'll just imagine that there's a big crowd applauding for you right now. Was, you packed so much into those 30 minutes. I you know, really am just excited. I knew, I knew you were going to do a great job, but how tailored it was towards really, I feel like our, our key audience members in this B2B plant-based world that have experienced this transformation over the last couple of years of having to try to convince everyone from our colleagues to our family members that plant-based is a thing and you should try it or at least pay attention to it to all of a sudden, you know, this is the, the most important line item on any major yes. corporations, you know, board meetings in order to stay relevant in this industry and, and world. And that to be able to take that and put it into numbers, put it into slides, break it down in a way that we can really kind of understand where we've been where we're going is, is very special. So thank you for providing us with that. And without any further ado, I'm gonna jump into some of these questions because we're there's no way we're gonna get to all of them. These are great. We're gonna get to as much as we can kind of over the next 25 minutes, if that works for you. Sure thing. And just to reintroduce myself, I might've forgotten in the excitement in the beginning. I am Ben Davis. I am content director for Plant-Based World Expo, which launched in 2019 at the Javits Center in New York City. We decided uh, to take a break in 2020, you know, just didn't, didn't feel like the right year to hold a trade show. And we're gonna come back bigger and stronger and better than ever in 2021. Um, we're also launching our European event in London in 2021 as well. So we'll provide plenty more information on that. We're excited to see everyone in person I'm going to answer one question real quick uh, from Sergio here, uh, and I'm going to pass it to you, but I also want to re-plug my, my favorite brand as I answer it. So who's next on breaking through, fill in the blank, beyond burger is to burgers as blank is to plant-based seafood. I'm going to go ahead and shout out Good Catch again, just because I don't, on a flavor level, their products blow me away. I mean, I grew up going to Cape Cod and eating crab cakes and seafood. I mean, that was the hardest thing for me, kind of my final cheat food until I finally stopped craving it anymore was, was seafood and shellfish. Um, and so when Good Catch started coming out with these products that they, you know, they describe it as it tastes like the sea. Um, mm -hmm. They don't say it tastes like fish. And that's, it really does. It's got this fresh uh, ocean taste to it um, and their brand is doing some really cool things. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw good catch a, another shout out and you know, you have any other thoughts on that one as far as the next big company in the seafood space. I do think the plant-based seafood company is really out there with their whole 
whole products. So, you know, we talked about moving from the burgers and the, the minced products to actually like bacon and steak, things that have form. And so the plant-based seafood company is doing scallops and shrimp and they're ready to rock. I've had them. They're like, go for it people. So they're there. And I, you know, again, I can't say enough good things about Good Catch because they're so mission aligned to moving the world forward. And they're so deeply invested. You know, they have their own manufacturing plant, which they just opened in Ohio this year. I mean, this is great for scalability. And it's also, you know, when people start getting a plant-based paycheck, you're really going to see the world turn. So, you know, if you imagine that they're employing a bunch of people who used to eat, you know, this, this is a animal agriculture, Ohio. Now those people and the whole family is going to be dependent on that paycheck. It makes a difference. Totally. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that tidbit there. And, you know, we're really excited about watching this space develop, uh, particularly on the seafood side. Um, all right. Here's a, here's a question. This is a, a kind of a, a really important one. I feel like what categories are not being served well currently by the plant-based market that you've found? Is there any kind of white space that you see some potential in, but maybe, you know, the, the market hasn't quite caught up yet? Okay, we are back to fermented folks. The white space is cheese. I know you're saying, yeah, but there are vegan cheeses out there. They haven't really nailed it yet. And so fermented proteins, what the heck is a fermented protein? Okay, so this is where the marketers myself, we get to have a field day because this conversation about how you communicate this to the consumer is critical if they are to accept it. But fermented uh, cheese, for example, would be cells taken from a cow, like as easily as their saliva or something like this. And then it's mapped onto, let's say a, a mushroom, the mushroom is fermented and you get um, the properties that you would need to make cheese because you started with those original animal cells and then you can flavor it, et cetera. So I think fermented proteins are going to play a huge role. The company that comes to mind is Change Foods. They're making big headways in cheese. And I think that's the white space and that's the next thing to conquer. Love that. I'm going to call it the tempeh takeover. <laughs> tempeh these days. I know that these products that you're describing are going to go into these other applications as well and maybe not be branded as tempeh, but I think tempeh deserves a shout out. I, I, can I just add to that? Yeah. Oh, I love tempeh. So tempeh is whole food. It's going to give you so much protein. It's got all that fiber. And then it's kind of a blank slate. You know, cooking is all about spices. So you just take some paprika, some soy sauce, some cumin, and you mix that up and then um, marinate the tofu, the tempeh in it. Oh gosh, you got yourself a great um, meal. On my go-to these days. So and shout out to Light Life there. I found their brand has just the the really good texture, um, super My easy to cook. Throw it in the pan with a little bit of oil and any sauce and seasoning you want. It's delicious. So shout out to, to Life Life for two reasons. They're also my go-to and they are 41 years old. So one of the absolute oh. forerunners of the plant-based movement, they bring history. They are the leaders you know, really in the plant-based movement because they're one of the founders, we'll say, with like Seth, Seth Tibbet of Tofurky. So shout out to Light Life. On top of that, they're also an example of a story of someone who, who decided to partner with a big food brand, with Maple Leaf Foods, you know, one of the biggest food producers out of Canada, um, you know, a brand that took this seriously very early on, created a whole subsidiary called Greenleaf Foods to, you know, to be able to message and market their products that are plant-based in a way that is different than you know the rest of their animal-based foods, and we do have some questions here. I don't I don't know if we'll get to all of them about you know just the what it what comes along with growing a, a brand in that way by aligning with a, a company that might have practices that aren't necessarily aligned. Um, and you know maybe we can get into this real quick. You know just from my perspective, it's so important to embrace these large corporations and companies. And obviously, you know, we've gotten to where we are today. There's all sorts of reasons and we can analyze forever what, what's gone wrong or which practices we don't want to align with in the future. But in order to get everyone on board, we need to support the companies with the biggest amount of power, the most money, the deepest pockets to get excited about participating in this space, even if they're not ready to completely transform their portfolio. And when you have someone like Maple Leaf, Greenleaf purchasing a brand like Light Life, all of a sudden these products become so much more accessible. You see commercials on the World Series for a Light Life burger with probably not something that can happen when they're on their own. 100%, I couldn't agree with this more. So Light Life actually sold to Maple Leaf. I don't think it's a partnership. They actually sold to them. And then in doing so, they also bought Field Roast and then they created, as you said, Greenleaf Foods and Greenleaf Foods is this umbrella for Field Roast and Light Life, its own division in Chicago away from Maple Leaf in Canada. So when you do that, you get 
distribution channels. So we talked about, we didn't talk about it too much, but some of the issue here is scaling up. So finding the right co-manufacturing facility to partner with to make your food so you can just not get it to Brooklyn and Los Angeles, but the whole United States, very tricky. And then who's got the money if you can't find that right co-manufacturer, because most of them make meat, you know, so and they don't have the right technology or the know-how for plant-based. And if you can't find that partner, that means you have to invest in your own plant. You're talking 40 million at bare minimum. So you get those deep pockets, you get those existing distribution channels. And when you have deep pockets, you can start advertising. So suddenly you see the ad campaign campaign about how manly it is to eat plants because you've got the pockets of something like light life. So like, again, for light life, you know, we are talking about good catch and they invested about 40 million into a small plant of about 40,000 square feet. Light life invested 320 million into a plant that's 360,000 square feet offering 420 jobs to, to animal agriculture, Indiana. If you assume a household of four, you're talking about 1700 people dependent on that plant-based paycheck. So everything just gets bigger and easier with bigger pockets. Great, great response there. And, you know, absolutely just, you know, especially from, from our perspective here at Plant-Based World, you know, we encourage our audience, everyone in this space, the more we can embrace everyone's perspective, if you're wanting to engage and whether it's creating plant-based products, buying them, selling them to consumers, the more of that, the better. And trusting that, you know, over time, we, we gravitate more and more towards the healthier, more ethical products, you know, because that's really where the demand is. And that's what these companies are going to follow. Yes, hundred uh, percent. A, a related question here that I'd love to love to get in front of you. This is from Rachel, um, commenting on how a lot of the plant-based brands that we've been, you know, fully transparent are processed and aren't necessarily in the whole food plant-based category. Um, you know, have plenty of benefits and might not necessarily be uh, falling into a category of a diet that would, you know, reverse heart disease, but you know, have have all these other benefits related to sustainability and, and ethics and all that. So. Even if these brands are claiming to be healthy, um, but aren't necessarily the same as going to the produce section and eating whole foods, how as a retailer, you know, do you think that it's, you can inform consumers of what the truth is and what the benefits are? Do you have any, anything that's worked or that you've seen or from conversations that, um, you know, as far as this communication, engaging with the consumer, how do we communicate the nuances of these differences in value propositions? Yes. And you're asking specifically in terms of health or also about the environment? So the, que the question from Rachel is health related. You know, if a brand is claiming to be healthy, but it's not necessarily a whole food healthy option, how yes, is okay. a retailer, do you with integrity engage with your consumer over a product like that? Yes. Okay. So I love this question and I really do encourage because we won't solve it today in 12 minutes. Um, this is a very interesting conversation and this is where grocery stores can really take the lead because consumers are dying for this information. Here's what I would do. I'm going to rattle off some more numbers. Okay. Are, is this product reversing heart disease? Probably not, but it doesn't have antibiotics. It doesn't have hormones. It doesn't have cholesterol. It doesn't produce TMAO, trimethylene N oxide, which is something that um, animal proteins produce in the body when they're eaten. That's a little bit too complex for the consumer, but I'm just listing for you. Um, and it does have a little bit of fiber. You know, it's a meat has no fiber. I never knew that. <laughs> meat has no fiber. So it's impossible to be healthy without fiber. So these processed foods aren't going to have lots of fiber, but they are going to have a little bit of some. So you've got some value proposition there, particularly in the no antibiotics, no hormones, no cholesterol. So they're all are benefits. Um, and then you've got all the environmental benefits. So it's crafting that conversation with integrity, as you say, that's really informative. But I, I don't, I think there's been a disservice again, the poor consumer so confused. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got the message going out there, plant based, it's so healthy. And then you've got the meat industry saying, oh, it's all chemicals. And they're trying to find their way. And I think when I talk to doctors, because I interview a lot of doctors, they all say that these foods are transition foods that are better for you, but not the end goal, something you don't want to do every day, but you know, twice a week instead of meat, a much better option. So I think there is that conversation to be crafted about the incremental benefit even if it isn't, you know, um, Tempe. <laughs> awesome. That's great. And right, Rachel, so please come find me because we can have that dialogue. It's a longer dialogue than just this. 
there are so many good questions here. Just wanted to shout out everybody in this webinar right now who is so passionately engaging with what we have to say. And I'm sure we're not, there's no chance we're gonna get through all these in the next 10 minutes, but uh, you know, both of us will have our contact info readily available and we'll be following up with all sorts of exciting uh, follow-ups to this content and live eventually in New York City. So just continue to engage with us and you know, this is such an important conversation to be having and thank you for your feedback. Um, Going to uh, follow up with another question from Rachel uh, related to retail. I think this is important as well. Um, do you get any consistent <laughs> feedback as far as hesitation from retail buyers specifically? And maybe this comes from your conversation with companies and brands as to the challenges they're facing of getting into retail. Can you speak at all to what some of those obstacles might be? Yes, and I want a clarification on the question. Are we talking about established brands or startups? Um, you know, that that isn't specified in the question. So maybe okay. a little bit for both and maybe just the yeah. general, you know, for the retailers out there who might be a little bit behind the curve as far as adopting. You know, some of them have, you know, like we've seen Kroger and Hannaford take this lead and there's information and data. The ones that are now seeing that data and, and the plant-based is in their ear are there hesitations? What, what do we need to get those, those, that group kind of across the edge? Um, for the retailers that aren't quite there yet. Exactly. Um, oh gosh. I mean, I think the numbers speak so loudly. So um, it, if, if there is a retailer that's hesitating, I would not talk ethics or environment. I would talk bottom line numbers. I hope I'm answering this question right. I, I want to make sure that I understood it correctly. I, I guess, okay. So before, so that's a great point. Are there any reasons for hesitation that you've been aware of? And, and maybe there aren't. Maybe everyone at this point is kind of ready to jump in and just trying, trying to figure out the best way to do it as far as a, you know, a retailer goes. Um, yes. The question is really asking, are, are there any consistent hesitations? And maybe we're past that. You know, I've found in a lot of ways that when having this conversation, we have gotten over this hump of needing to convince people that this is important. And it, it, we're into this camp of, all right, how do we do it? How do we implement it? What are some kind of tactical conversations that we can have? And it saves a lot of time because people aren't needing to kind of be convinced to pay attention anymore. And so yes. maybe that's kind of where we're at. I would say almost. Um, the, the thing is that COVID was this great accelerant for plant-based foods and our health and being mindful of the environment, et cetera. But COVID also threw such a wrench into things that grocery stores have been hesitant or maybe fearful that they just want to put on the shelves the things that they thought people wanted. A lot of them haven't realized, oh, people want something different now. And they haven't been nimble enough to make that shift. Um, so they just wanted to go back to the old world we knew. Let's close our eyes and pull the blanket over our head. I mean, many people feel that way on a daily basis, but they were just saying, hey, look, it sold last year. I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. I'm not going to take risks with my, with my business. I'm just going to get what sold last year. And that unwillingness to be nimble in COVID and embrace the changes that the consumer has already made for themselves is putting them behind. So I have seen that hesitation that they're afraid to bring in new products because they don't know how they will do and that this is a frightening position for them, but they have um, not fared well because of it. So by hoping that the world will go back to the way it was or by just doing business like you did in 2018 or 2019, that's just not gonna be a winning strategy for the grocery store. So the ones that are doing the best are the ones that are um, nimble enough to make these adjustments, not just in what they buy, but how they can communicate what they've got to the consumer and how they revamp that store experience. It's great. I love how it comes back to your, your key state of the un union, which is that a conversation with the empowered consumer. All right, I've got a few more questions here that I've already pinpointed as really worth asking. So if you ask another question or you know, I might not get to it again, you can reach out to us afterwards. Um, just really excited to ask you a food service related question since we have been so heavy on the retail so far. Um, you know, food service is obviously in such a different position to the retail folks. You know, just to kind of piggyback on what you were saying with that last question, um, you know, some brands that kind of fell in the middle there were being plant-based, but already having good distribution in retail, follow your heart comes to mind. Um, so they, they had some of their biggest months in history over the course of the summer because they already had distribution in these retail stores and, and the orders just kept coming in. They were, people are buying more plant-based, they're able to have success and that's great. 
but a lot of these companies had to pivot from food service to retail and had challenges there. Yes. This question is regarding food service um, establishments and related to kind of the COVID, the coming back from COVID, restaurants are trying to do anything they can to encourage people to, to choose their restaurant as we come back. Um, you know, do you have any, any, anything you could recommend as far as food service uh, from a marketing standpoint, from what to put on your menu standpoint, that's like, you know, a good, good trend right now that could help people get some more folks in the doors. Yes. So we are back to the whole world kind of needs to rebrand itself, right? Because we're it's a, COVID is in a, is forced us to be different hundred percent. So I would say that for food service, uh, and when you say food service, are you talking about restaurants and quick serve? Or are you talking about cafeterias, et cetera? You know, I'm, it's, it's, I'm trying to read the questions and, and yes. have the conversation at the same time. So yes. I'm doing the best I can. This yes. is actually asking about local restaurants. Um, yes. so there's a vegan restaurant week in Southern Maryland and is kind of trying to get some information for how local restaurants can feature, you know, more plant-based options and, and kind of properly uh, get the word out to the public. Yes. So this is great. So if you're local, then I would really be focusing on my social media strategy as a way to engage that local community to let them know how you have been nimble and changing for COVID and what you're offering and what you're doing special. Um, one of the things I do do because I work with startups and grocery stores and meat and dairy, but I also work with some restaurants to revamp their menus and to rebrand themselves like, hey, we got the memo. We don't just have like one or two options here. We've got a whole section of our menu now, and we want to capitalize on that and reach that plant-based consumer. So anything you can do, Maryland, um, local Maryland, to really highlight to your community, and I'm assuming you're local, you don't have huge budgets. So I would focus on that social media, really getting um, engaging. I hope this isn't too tactical, but some contests, some quizzes, some some maybe a local influencer things, so you can really get some meaningful connection to your base and let them know just how fast fabulous you are for being nimble and, and, you know, keeping, keeping it rocking during COVID. I hope that's helpful. I, I love that. And I, you know, I think the tactical stuff, I would hope that people appreciate and I imagine they do, you know, it's, it's one thing to kind of hear even statistics and trends kind of repeated and, and in your ear over and over again, but sometimes just get, Hey, have you tried, you know, work with a local influencer and see if you can get the word out, get them to be excited about something. So it's coming from someone that people look up to and trust rather than feeling like a marketing message or kind of going through these traditional channels. Um, you know, these are things that are very simple and someone who doesn't live in that particular world just might not have thought of. So hopefully that's uh, value to someone jump in there really fast and say, because I do a lot of this for my clients, please focus on the influencers that get the vision that aren't in it for the bucks. Just really got it, got it. Cause that's voice has to be real and they have to really want the brand to succeed. You know, they have to be in there as a player, not just somebody who posts and like leaves. Absolutely. And I know there's a lot of cool stuff in the works that isn't necessarily ready to be spoken about yet, but just as far as the influencers the influencer and impactor scene that exists within this space is so powerful, you know, more mm -hmm. so than anywhere else, I feel like because of the passion that's behind the people who have developed followings. And so I feel like this voice, you know, we've only just barely noticed and tapped into the potential of what this community can do through these channels. So let's just keep an eye on that. And, you know, there'll, there'll be opportunities for brands and companies to tap into that, you know, even more so in the future. All right, this is a cool question um, from Sergio and uh, I'll do one more after this about the, tr the trade show because I've got a couple questions about that. Um, mm -hmm. This one is about multicultural audiences and just, you know, I'm curious if anything pops into your head, um, you know, just about different cultures and how they might you know, interact or have an affinity towards plant-based. Have you found that any of these uh, cultural um, audiences, whether it's African-Americans, Asian-Americans, Latinos, anyone in particular that has gravitated more so towards plant-based? Are there any, you know, specific palates or, you know, eating styles that culturally have, have piqued your interest in any way? I will talk about all three super fast. There's a great push um, with the African-American community to let them know about plant-based options because historically what they were eating has been not great for their health. So there's, um, and I, I work with these influencers. So I, you know, again, people contact me because we're going to run out of time, but um, there's a very- uh, Borough President Eric Adams book right there. Have you read it yet? 
I've interviewed him. He's wonderful. <laughs> I got He's... the right review on it. It's on our site as well. If you want to just saying there's more information we've both done on that, but it's a great book that really breaks down the African-American perspective on this, this shit. And a hundred percent. And I've worked with doctors in Chicago who've taken entire um, African-American communities and put them on a plant-based diet for, for Lent for so 40 days of going plant-based and how the community as a whole, their numbers and how they shifted. And, and that mindset of, of, you know, that education, process of just learning about like, hey, these foods maybe aren't the best for me and how we can switch. There's a huge growth in the Latin American community because there's huge growth in Latin America of plant-based items. So Chile is rocking it, Argentina, Brazil. These company, these countries are really coming a long way, Mexico. And so there's this constant communication between the Hispanic community here and Latin America. So Latin American companies are killing it. Um, the not company comes to mind, but there are many others. Um, and then the Asian American community, lucky for them, they They've already had a tradition of vegetables, so it's not as hard of a sell for them. And also the um, Asian community and the African-American community, both of those communities are highly lactose intolerant. So they have a leg up on saying like, I don't want dairy anyway. Absolutely. That's uh, it's a cool, cool little breakdown. And it is really interesting, especially as some of these alternative companies, you know, the impossibles and beyonds work to get into markets that are actually across the world. Yes. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to put a, a burger on every menu in the United States, right? Is that necessarily the center of the plate protein that someone in China is going to want um, and, and connect to as, you know, part of their culture? And you know, I think that's something that we're still seeing right now um, is how these brands that might have started in one place with a certain palate interact with other cultures on kind of their own home, home turf, so to speak, right? Yes, this is why Beyond Meat, Omni Pork, and Impossible Foods are doing so well with plant-based pork in China and all of Asia. You're going to see plant-based pork go to ten and a half billion dollars by 2030, um, and it's going to be 40 percent of what people eat in the plant-based spectrum because the, these companies and others are making such a big push for plant-based pork, which is so big in Asian cuisine. Pork is so big in Asian cuisine. Absolutely. It's just, it's just another, it's a cool, cool to kind of end on this note because it just shows how, how untapped, the money, you know, where there's so much to yeah. talk about, we're able to pack in this much yeah. exciting conversation and data and research all that into an hour here. And it's still the, the very, very tip of the iceberg, the transformations we're going to see as we come out of COVID completely, as people start eating in a way where they're free to live their lives, but also fully focused on having more resilient bodies, sustaining our planet, creating space for all the beings to share uh, in, in harmony here, you know, which is just something that's happening across, across waves right now, you know, just so excited to see. So uh, the last question I just wanted to answer was related to our trade show. Um, so thank you, uh, Emma, for this question. And it, and it piggybacks off a point you made about the IFFA allowing the plant-based meats to exhibit and then kind of throwing it back at us, will, will plant-based world showcase cell-based or blended food products? Um, and it's an interesting question. You know, I, we, part, of our, part of our business is definitely uh, fall, every, every one of our exhibitors and companies that we support, we decided off the bat has to fit into the vegan regulations, right? And we use the vegan.org mm -hmm. uh, uh, breakdown, but really it's kind of standard. It just can't contain animal products. Um, and, and, and you're welcome to exhibit with us. So with that in mind, I don't think we ever intend to have blended products because um, that would be including, you know, animal based, if, especially if it's a traditional animal product blended. We, we certainly would not allow that into our expo floor. Um, the cultured products are interesting because they, they certainly don't fit technically into the category that, you know, would be vegan, would be plant based. But at the same time, I certainly see it as an, an ally. In, in our mission to reduce factory farming, to create a food system that works for everybody. Um, and so it's something that, you know, uh, we've played with and, and certainly is on our radar of perhaps having, you know, an offshoot or a, a conference track that touches on this. You know, we definitely talked about it in our conference back in 2019. Um, certainly can't, can't say for sure that we'd ever allow cell-based products on our exhibit floor, but, I, you know, I still feel like we're a ways off from, from that. You know, I'm curious what, what your thoughts are and how we integrate, you know, these two two different markets that could be at odds with each other, but really do have a very similar purpose in existing. Yeah, well, I do think cellular agriculture is the death of uh, animal agriculture. It, it just does the same thing with 
out the environmental damage with using your resources better. It's once they scale it and you know, they work out the tech issues, it's better for the bottom line. And of course it's better for animals and it's better for pandemics. So there's just no reason, there's no reason that you would have factory farming. So I do really want to see it succeed. Um, I think it's going to be a very interesting dialogue with the consumer because they are forging ahead with tech. You know, we spent so much time on taste and texture and tech. The, the consumer is not going to say like, give me some lab meat. That's not going to happen. So that whole marketing conversation, this is why I'm saying this is really the time to engage uh, with your consumer. And, you know, I hope you hire me, but hire somebody because that conversation has got to be had and you want to get out of it, out in front of it before meat and dairy does you know, because they're going to be out there having a different kind of conversation than what you want for your products. So um, I do think it's a good thing. I think fermented is really just going to pave the way for cellular agriculture. So you're going to see fermented products starting this year, 2021. They're going to be fermented microbes. A microbe is not an animal and it's not a plant. It's its own thing. So that could probably be in your show, maybe. You know, yeah, well, it's similar, you know, when you when you say it that way, it's similar to even the mushroom based. hundred percent. Technically a fungi. But we certainly, there, there's no question in our mind that that belongs in plant-based, um, you know, as, as far as the cell-based stuff, we'll, we'll really have to see how it, yeah. how it develops and, and what its place within kind of as us as a business and a trade show, what we're serving in the market, we'll see how we can support. And, you know, as we approach our show, our launch in, in London and our second show here in New York, um, you know, cellular agriculture will certainly be a conversation that you'll hear. Uh, in conference rooms or on the show floor, you know, it's it's not something where, where anyone's going to stop talking about anytime soon. Um, but we also feel there's so much happening, uh, as you've learned from from this hour on the ground with regards to plant based, um, that we don't necessarily need to look for other things to be covering right now. You know, right. yeah. from <laughs> our perspective of having cornered this this niche, yeah. you know, niche market, right, plant based, <laughs> that's also now taken over the world and is yeah. and is such an important topic for anyone, whether you're in it for your, your passionate vegan ethical reasons, or you own the biggest retail chain in the world, like it's, you have to be paying attention. So yes, yes. Cause very soon we're not going to be the alt. We're going to be the thing. So. There you go. And you have a graph to prove it. And that, yes, I mean, that's so, so important. You start having data and that's not, not even something that's really existed yet. And so as these reports and, and research continues to come in, there's going to be even more justification for people to continue to invest and, and pay attention to it. Yes. And I just want to say again, that chart comes from A.T. Kearney and uh, Edison Financial Research. And I'm pretty much guessing they're not vegan. So we'll just go with it's very much a third party report. Love that. Well, anyways, we are going to put the recording of this up. It has all of Elizabeth's action packed slides and her walking you through them. So we'll have that. Um, make sure to subscribe to our newsletter, theplantbasedworld.com uh, is where we post all of our content. We'll be sharing this recording as well. All of our contact info. Anybody who asked a great question that we didn't get to answer, there were lots sorry. of you and you know, we're sorry, we only had this much time, uh, but thanks for letting us know that you're appreciating what we're doing and we're certainly gonna be doing more of this kind of stuff. And there's still 70 plus people with us here at the end of an hour and almost 10 minutes over now. So just really super grateful for everyone being here and have a lovely holiday. Elizabeth, uh, we'll be excited to reconnect with you in the new year and watch all of these bold projections come to life. Um, a quick little word before I go. Yes, I'm so excited. We started this conference by saying, you know, we are living in exciting times and I, I couldn't agree with that more. So I can't wait to collaborate with you in 2021, Ben, because I think we've got some, some great things to help get out there and pave the way. Um, if anybody does go to the recording after this, I would just appreciate it if you're going to use these slides in any way, if you'd be kind enough to contact me, because as I um, put the slideshow together, I just want to make sure that if the information has a life beyond me that it's that it's like put in the right context and stuff so I do hope that um, you'll reach out to me and then of course just reach out to me if you have any other questions but um, if you think you're going to use any slides please please reach out to me and uh, yeah you can always hit me up elizabethalfano.com slash pbh is the plant-based business hour or all my consulting is there as well at elizabethalfano.com so I'm excited to have dialogues with everybody and be back with you Ben because we could have gone on for three hours here so we really could and we'll table a lot of this for uh, when we get to meet up at at a convention okay. center, hopefully the Javits Center, not too far from now in New York City. And I also just wanted to, to say real quick, because there's so many people asking great questions about more health related stuff. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we kept this conversation a little more B2B focused for the, you know, that yeah. brand and buyer audience. 
Um, a couple resources for people who are looking for health-related information, uh, the Plantrition Project, plantritionproject.org and nutritionfacts.org. That's Dr. Michael Greger's website um, uh, are two of just the greatest resources that, you know, with a simple search um, can help you find a doctor or some information on um, some, some of the more health-related concerns out there that are obviously so crucial to this conversation. So definitely go and give them a sure. shot. Sure. And the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, I'm one of, I work with them quite often. I'm one of their Food for Life instructors about putting together unique and healthy recipes. So um, I work with a lot of doctors. So you can, you can hit me up if you're looking for context therein or just directly uh, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Yes, and uh, um, ACLM as well, American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Yes. A, lot, a lot of overlap between the you know the folks who have been pioneering those groups, but uh, each has kind of a different role within the space and, and lots of great resources. So thank you all again so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Happy yeah. holidays. Happy New Year. Happy holidays. Uh, go to www.plantbasedworldexpo.com to find out all the information about our trade shows, which we are looking forward to holding live and in person in London and New York City in 2021. Uh, and we will, it'll be such a celebration and a reunion uh, when we get to see everybody in person. So everybody have a great rest of your year and we'll be in touch. Bye everybody. Looking forward to connecting with all of you personally. Reach out. <laughs>